Until 30 years ago, nobody knew that this one bird was probably the most important animal in India's natural ecosystem. And it wasn't rare or anything. Before the 1990s, India had more than 4 crores of these birds all over the country. But something happened in that decade that changed everything. And these birds began to go extinct. In the span of a few years, diseases like tuberculosis and anthrax became much more common. Millions of people were being attacked by wild animals and catching rabies. And weirdest of all, it forced the Parsi community in India to rethink one of the most sacred aspects of their ancient religion. But how can one animal, that to a bird, leave such a massive impact on the Indian economy? And more importantly, what actually happened that caused the population of these birds to collapse from 4 crore to just 19,000? That's a 99.9% .9 decline in the span of just 10 years. This is an investigation into the largest animal extinction in human history. Look at these four birds. These are vultures, and together, they form the majority of the vulture population in India. For simplicity, I'm just going to refer to all of them as the Indian vulture. For thousands of years, the vulture was arguably the most important wild animal in India for one simple reason, scavenging. These birds are basically nature's cleanup crew because they can and will eat anything they find. And I mean literally anything. Their stomach acids are so strong, they can literally dissolve bones. They're able to digest rotting flesh riddled with dangerous germs like rabies and anthrax with zero issues. They can consume the carcass of an entire cow down to the bones in just 45 minutes. India is a country with some 20 crore cows and millions more livestock animals that many of us don't eat for religious reasons. When these animals die, they have to go somewhere, right? For thousands of years, vultures were taking care of that for us, happily consuming carcasses we had no use for. So farmers would simply find an open field to dump their dead livestock and vultures would handle the rest. It was a perfectly symbiotic relationship and the vulture population was booming. The skies teemed with these massive birds looming overhead with their 8-foot wingspan and sharp curved beaks. Before the 90s, they were so plentiful that airports would have to hire people to shoot them down so they wouldn't disrupt air traffic. But in those empty fields where farmers went to dump their dead animals, something was going on that nobody realized. Each year, fewer and fewer vultures were coming to feed on the carcasses. One of the first people to notice something was wrong was the Parsi community. You see, unlike Hindus and Muslims who either cremate or bury their dead, Zoroastrians practice a unique ritual to dispose of their dead, the sky burial. This is where they carry the bodies of dead Parsis to the top of a tower of silence, where they simply leave the body on the tower, exposed to the sky. All along the walls of the tower, vultures would sit and wait patiently for the corpse bearers to place the body down and leave the tower. Before long, they would begin their feast. The Parsis believe a traditional burial would pollute Mother Earth, and cremation would pollute fire, which is seen as the son of God. Instead, Giving up their bodies to vultures is like offering them back to nature itself and is seen as the purest form of disposal. That is, until the Parsis began to notice that their dead weren't disappearing as quickly as they used to. In the old days, there would be so many vultures at the Towers of Silence that the body would be consumed down to the bone in less than 30 minutes. But by 1996, they began to notice bodies just lying there, untouched for a week, then a month, then half a year. Instead of being efficiently consumed, the bodies would begin to rot, giving off a foul stench. In cities like Mumbai with a large Parsi community, people living in high-rise apartments near a tower of silence reported being able to see rotting bodies and an awful smell from their balconies. But the Parsis weren't the only ones to notice this. Dr. Vibhu Prakash, a biologist with the Bombay Natural History Society, was monitoring vulture nesting sites in the Keola Deo National Park in Rajasthan, where there were once close to a thousand vultures nesting. By 1998, he could only find one. Mysteriously, he was finding dead vultures of all age classes. Young, adolescent and fully grown birds were showing up dead in the area. 
This meant that it wasn't a problem related to mating or hatching or migration. When he examined the birds, he discovered that they were showing signs of kidney failure, with uric acid crystals forming around their internal organs. This seemed to be some kind of widespread issue, maybe a disease, maybe something in their food that was killing them. But what could it be? Scientists began exploring all possibilities, food shortages, habitat loss, diseases, pesticides, herbicides, toxic heavy metals, but nothing really stood out as a definitive cause for these alarmingly high numbers of dead birds. But they needed to find out quickly because if the problem was nationwide, the population collapse could have a far more devastating impact than anyone had anticipated. The real breakthrough happened not in India, but in Pakistan, where Dr. Lindsay Oakes and his team were investigating the population decline of the vultures. They noticed that most of the vultures had died of the same cause, kidney failure. Based on their observations, they deduced that the most likely cause was something that the vultures had eaten. By this point, they had exhausted all other options, so perhaps it was a pharmaceutical drug? They began looking for chemicals that fit four specific parameters. It had to be widely available, introduced recently to the market, it had to be able to pass through the vulture's strong stomach acids without being changed, and most importantly, could damage their kidneys. Dr. Oaks's team went to veterinarians and pharmacies all across Punjab to find any drugs that met these four criteria. And after several weeks of collecting data, they were able to narrow down the list of chemicals that matched all four of these parameters down to just one drug. Which brings us to 1970s Switzerland. Here, researchers had synthesized a brand new anti-inflammatory drug. In 1978, the Swiss pharmaceutical company Novartis acquired a patent for this drug, which they named Diclofenac. Diclofenac was used to combat inflammation, relieve pain, reduce fever, all with minimal side effects, quickly making it popular all over the world. But that patent was due to expire in 1993, and in that time, veterinarians had discovered that the drug worked just as well on animals as it did on humans. When 1993 finally rolled around, pharma companies around the world were free to produce their own generic versions of diclofenac. India, being the country with the largest population of cattle, went ahead and approved it for use with livestock, and the first batch of diclofenac designed specifically for farm animals hit the market in 1994. And honestly, it worked great. Diclofenac was quite a mild drug that had no adverse effects on humans or animals. It helped farmers treat infections in their livestock, and it was cheap enough that anyone could afford it. It was a win-win for everyone involved. That is, until Dr. Lindsay Oakes' team began their investigation into the mass vulture deaths in Punjab. As the researchers went from one pharmacy to another, they observed over and over again that of all the veterinary drugs available, only diclofenac was commonly available, had only been introduced to the market a few years ago, and was capable of passing through the vulture's digestive system before poisoning their kidneys. But there was only one way to be absolutely sure they had to perform some experiments. The researchers fed the vultures some diclofenac to see what happens. Within 58 hours, the birds were dead from kidney failure. They then made some more vultures eat carcasses of animals that had been treated with diclofenac before death. Again, the same thing happened. Almost all the birds died soon after. The results were beyond conclusive. India was bearing witness to a mass extinction of a keystone species caused not by pollution or poaching, but by a simple prescription drug. Okay, but this seems a bit over dramatic, right? I mean, all that these vultures are doing is eating some dead animals. Even if they stop doing that, won't those animals just decompose naturally? Maybe some other animals would scavenge them, and I know it sounds gross, but we're all biodegradable, so what's the big deal? Well, actually, it's a huge deal. To understand why, we need to look at what makes vultures way better scavengers than any other animal. First of all, they are not picky eaters. Vultures will happily eat every part of the body, from the soft, tasty organs to the hard, gamey tissue. In comparison, other scavengers like wild dogs and rats will only eat the best parts of the carcass, leaving the rest to just rot away. When you have half a billion livestock animals across the country, those dead bodies pile up fast. Oh, and also, remember those super strong stomach acids vultures have? 
Well, the reason they have that is to eliminate harmful viruses and bacteria like anthrax, rabies and tuberculosis. So what happens when you don't have vultures? All those diseases enter the bodies of dogs and rats who could transfer them to humans by either biting us or contaminating our food and water supplies. And after farmers noticed vultures weren't coming, they began throwing dead livestock into rivers, contaminating our water supply with deadly pathogens. But it gets worse. Much worse. Now that feral dogs and rats have way less competition for food, their populations have exploded, leading to way more attacks on humans, especially children. Between 1996 and 2006, an estimated 4 crore dog bites have resulted in 47,000 deaths from rabies. All told, it's believed that vultures disappearing has caused an additional 5 lakh premature deaths just between the year 2000 and 2005. Aside from the cost to human life, there's also the economic costs associated with increased deaths and healthcare expenses, which amount to more than 6 lakh crore rupees every single year. I mean, just the cost of building and running incinerators would be something like 8,000 crore rupees annually, not to mention the environmental impact of burning so many animal carcasses. Simply put, vultures occupy an essential space in our ecosystem that no other animal or technology could possibly replace. They are truly nature's cleanup crew, quietly doing the job no one else wants to and getting no appreciation for it. Because even after knowing all this about the importance of vultures, we still don't really care. Just look at how India rallied behind the campaign to save tigers. There were documentaries, advertisements, slogans. The government spends 300 crore rupees every year to fund tiger conservation efforts. And don't get me wrong, that's great. Project Tiger has been a huge success. But that's only because tigers are sexy. They're easily recognizable, they're cool apex predators, and they're good for tourism. It's just easy to advertise a tiger. But <laughs> vultures? They've got these awkward bodies, long featherless necks, a kind of evil looking face, and the thing they're known for is eating dead animals. It's not their fault that they have such bad PR, which means that even today, over 20 years after we figured out that we'd accidentally caused the greatest extinction of a single species in human history, we've only just started making progress with real, honest-to-God vulture conservation. Veterinary diclofenac was banned by the Indian government in 2006, and more recently, other drugs shown to be harmful to vultures. Meanwhile, scientists are currently testing anti-inflammatory drugs that are safe for vultures. But progress is slow. Even after diclofenac was banned, farmers continued to buy it off the black market and use it because it's so cheap and effective. I mean, can you blame them? These are poor farmers trying to cut costs on their day-to-day -day expenses. Vultures going extinct is pretty low on their priority list. To really change things, we need equally effective and cheap alternatives to diclofenac. And it's only in the last few years that research has produced some promising results. Now it's time to start educating cattle farmers on the new options like meloxicam and tolfenamic acid. At the same time, vulture conservation breeding centers have opened across India in Haryana, West Bengal, Assam and Madhya Pradesh. Here, they breed endangered vulture species and raise them to maturity before releasing them out into the wild. Of course, that's a challenge because vultures typically only lay one egg per year and take five years to reach adulthood. In the wild, vulture populations are regularly monitored for signs of decline and animal carcasses are analyzed to make sure they don't contain traces of diclofenac. The Ministry of Environment even offered financial support of 12 crore rupees towards vulture research. But that's just a drop in the bucket compared to the estimated 207 crore rupees it would take to establish a more widespread conservation effort. Because politicians only give funding to projects that give them visibility. And who's going to care about saving a bunch of vultures? My hope from this video is that more people learn about India's most endangered animal so they may one day play an active role in saving the Indian vulture from extinction. The real irony here is that vultures, known to be one of the hardiest species on the planet, who can consume deadly diseases and rotting flesh without blinking, have been driven to the brink of destruction by a drug that we use to relieve joint pain. 
nature has always been unpredictable where some of the most powerful creatures on earth have been decimated by the most mundane threats whether natural or man made the difference now is that humans have the power and the knowledge to reverse the damage we've done to our environment the question is will we thank you so much for watching if you enjoyed this video please drop a like subscribe to my channel and leave a comment you can also support my channel by becoming a member where you'll get early access to videos vote on my upcoming video topics and ask me questions every month i'm anish bhargav and i'll see you in the next one